Hello and welcome to World Connect. Women power was the essence of this week as the world celebrated International Women's Day. In today's edition of World Connect, we will tell you how one Jordanian woman is making a world of difference in the lives of women. How one all-women band of musicians has taken the Arab world by storm and how a woman continues to lead the democratic transition in Myanmar. So strap yourself onto your seats as we take you through that and on a journey across continents in World Connect, your window to the world. Let's get started with the focus of the show. Nearly 14,000 migrants trapped on Greece's closed border with Macedonia battle hunger, freezing temperatures and subhuman conditions as concerns rise over an EU-Turkey deal on migrants. Democracy icon Aung San Suu Kyi's top aide Hitin Kwa steps closer to becoming Myanmar's first civilian president. Parliament to formally vote next week for the top post, even as armed forces refuse to clear the path for Suu Kyi to officially lead as president. Republican Donald Trump and Democrat Hillary Clinton lead the race for nominations for U.S. presidential election in their respective parties. Ohio and Florida are among key states to vote in primaries next week. Hillary Clinton handed down a shock defeat at Michigan primary. Jordan's Lena Khalife garners praise from across the world for establishing She Fighter, Jordan's only martial arts training center for women. Their frustration is fast turning to despair. Their broken spirits are further battered by relentless rainfall. Many have fallen ill and there is not enough food, water, medicines, firewood or blankets. Such is the plight of thousands of migrants stuck at a transit camp near the Greece-Macedonia border. Because Macedonia is refusing to let them cross over. And Macedonia is not the only one. Refused onward travel through Europe, these migrants face an uncertain fate. And Greece risks becoming a huge refugee camp. Hungry, braving freezing temperatures and relentless rainfall with nearly no hygiene and sanitation facilities. Nearly 14,000 migrants trapped on Greece's closed border with Macedonia are living in subhuman conditions. They are stranded at Idomeni after Macedonia closed its doors to refugees, sealing shut the main migration route to Western Europe. Although most of the migrants vow to remain on the border until the gate reopens, some exhausted by the harsh reality and fearing for the most vulnerable members of their family are losing heart and thinking of leaving. Feeling not good here. Is, nobody's can, uh, living here. You say it's jungle cold, winter, windy, very cold here. Nobody can complete his life here. And we don't know how many days we are staying here. The closure followed similar moves by other countries along the so-called Western Balkan route, the overland path taken by lakhs of migrants who have entered Europe from Turkey through Greece on their trek to desirable northern European destination countries such as Germany and Sweden. Slovenia, Croatia and Serbia closed their doors to migrants without visas or proper authorization to continue along the route. The closures had been signaled at the end of an emergency summit between EU heads of government and Turkey when leaders declared that the Western Balkans route would be sealed to migrants, bringing an end to irregular migration into Europe. At the summit, EU and Turkish leaders agreed in principle that Ankara would prevent people from leaving its shores for Europe in exchange for more help for refugees living in Turkey, visa liberalization for Turks visiting Europe and accelerating Turkey's long dormant EU accession talks. In February, nearly 1,800 people flooded into Greece from Turkey each day. But given the resistance to the deal by international humanitarian groups who say that blank mass returns run against the right of people fleeing war or persecution to seek asylum, 28 EU leaders have given themselves until the next summit due on March 17th and 18th to hone the details of the agreement. EU Migration Commissioner has said that the tentative deal would have to comply with EU and international law. 
in a bid to ease the burden on Greece, where some 41,000 migrants are now stranded in increasingly dire humanitarian conditions, the EU is stepping up relocations, with more than 900 people moved so far. However, that still falls far short of the 1,60,000 migrants that EU states have committed to move internally. Her admirers believe that she is the rightful claimant to the chair of presidency, yet barred by the constitution of Myanmar from it. Aung San Suu Kyi may not become Myanmar's president in near future, but a loyalist Hitin Kwa could well make it to the chair. A parliamentary vote next week will seal his fate. With the armed forces refusing to clear the path for Suu Kyi to lead officially as president, her admirers may have to wait longer for a change in the constitution. Who said I'm going to be the Prime Minister? The Prime Minister is below the President. I said I'm going to be above the President. And she fulfilled her word. Myanmar's democracy icon and symbol of resilience, Aung San Suu Kyi, is just days away from fulfilling her dream for her country. After almost five decades of military rule, Myanmar is all set to have a freely elected new government this April. Suu Kyi's top aide, Tin Kuo, is a front-runner to be the next president. Son of famous writer and poet Min Thu Woon, Tin is a lower house representative of the NLD. People across the political spectrum have largely welcomed his nomination. As the president, the responsibility is not only to govern the country but also to work together with foreign countries. The person in this position needs many skills. I think NLD proposed Tin Kwa's name for president because he is qualified for this task. A parliamentary vote next week will decide the president. As the NLD enjoys the majority in both the Houses of Parliament following last year's historic election, Tin Kuo is all set to take charge on the 1st of April. The party has however indicated that efforts will still be on to formally ensure People's Leader Aung San Suu Kyi gets the top post. Currently, a clause in the constitution does not allow her to become the president as her sons have British passports and are English citizens and not from Myanmar. I feel the same as everyone about the fact that Suu Kyi cannot become president. She is the true leader chosen by people. We still need to work on that. From years of silent struggle to heading a government, Aung San Suu Kyi's perseverance and adherence to principles have made her a much-loved people's leader. Fulfilling the people's huge mandate and their dreams is the next big job in store for her. Political analysts suggest an overall structural change is expected of the country's governance and economic scenario rather than a speedy one. While democracy is taking further root in Myanmar, Iran is at the center of a fresh geopolitical row again. United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon urged Iran to act with moderation and restraint and to avoid increasing regional tensions after Tehran's recent ballistic missile tests. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps test-fired two ballistic missiles on Wednesday, claiming they were designed to be able to hit Israel. While Iran defied the threat of new sanctions from US, North Korea threatened to carry out more nuclear tests. Russia and China have asked North Korea to resume talks over its nuclear program. The advice came as Pyongyang continued its rhetoric with leader Kim Jong-un, ordering the country to improve its nuclear attack capability by continuing to conduct more tests. Earlier this week, North Korea went on to threaten to respond with an all-out offensive against South Korea and the US over their annual military drills. On 11th March, Japan remembered the thousands of victims of the tsunami disaster that hit the nation five years ago in 2011. Crowds gathered to pray to the sound of Tokyo's iconic clock bell chiming out across the nation's capital at 1446, the exact hour that a massive earthquake had struck Japan. The nine magnitude earthquake triggered a tsunami that caused widespread destruction in northeastern Japan and caused the world's worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. Even as the people in Fukushima are not able to return to their hometowns due to the damage caused then, dozens of protesters took to the streets shouting anti-nuclear power slogans.
While Donald Trump draws flag from fellow Republicans over his Islam hates the US remarks, Democrats Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders crossed swords during the Florida debate. The presidential hopefuls are gearing up for the next big battle in the southern state of Florida with 246 delegates at stake. Thank you, everybody. Primaries will also be held next Tuesday at Illinois, Missouri, North Carolina and Ohio. In the Democratic race, Sanders, who's lagging behind Clinton in the delegate count, will hope to ride on his this week's Michigan victory. Republican Trump, fresh from wins at Michigan, Mississippi and Hawaii, will hope to consolidate his position this week. It is a must win for Senator Marco Rubio, who will try to win his home state, Florida, by all means. U.S. President Barack Obama offered a red carpet welcome for Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau at the White House on Thursday, ending a frosty period in relations between the two nations. The two countries agreed on joint steps to fight climate change, including cutting methane emissions from oil and gas operations and signing last year's Paris climate deal as soon as feasible. As the U.S.-Canada ties witness a new tour, Trudeau, whose liberals came to power last November, promising better cooperation with Washington, invited Obama to address the Canadian Parliament this year. The two countries also announced that they would work together to further harmonize regulations that will promote economic growth and benefits to their consumers and businesses. They also agreed to streamline the movement of people and cargo across the border. That means pre-clearance at more airports and train stations. The two leaders toasted at the state dinner at White House in honor of the visiting dignitary. To the friendship between Americans and Canadians and the spirit that binds us together, a genuine and deep and abiding respect for each and every human being. Cheers! Peruvians continued to have a tough time as heavy rains pounded parts of the South American country over the past couple of days. Heavy rain left 11 people dead, over 5,000 seriously affected and hundreds of houses destroyed this year. The weather conditions have been linked to the El Nino weather phenomenon. While floods in Peru threw life out of gear, water scarcity in Venezuela has people up in arms. Severe recession, soaring inflation and shortage of medicines add to that a severe water crisis and that deadly mix encapsulates the misery of Venezuelans. Water rationing forced upon them, they are angry. While the opposition has vowed to oust President Maduro from power, Maduro has thrown a challenge. Remove me if you can. Public anger is mounting in Venezuela with continuing water shortages forcing people to live in hardships. Long queues of people wanting to fill their containers are a common view in Caracas. Water supply has become an ever more pressing issue over recent years as the population grows and rains have diminished by 45% since 2013. Government says the crisis is the outcome of the El Nino phenomenon. The fact that no reservoir has been built in the country for more than a decade has further worsened the scenario. Frustrated with water rationing, people blame the government for not doing enough. Anti-government sentiment has already been simmering over a severe recession, soaring inflation and shortages of medicines. Meanwhile, Venezuelan opposition parties have vowed to oust President Nicolas Maduro, accusing him of an overall failure. Opposition Alliance said it would be holding protest rallies and a push for both a recall referendum and constitutional amendment to end Maduro's presidency. We call on all the people of Venezuela to mobilize to first of all secure the resignation of Nicolas Maduro of the presidency of the republic. The opposition which gained a majority in parliament last December for the first time in 17 years is desperate to capitalize on public ire. Removing Maduro will be difficult because the government can count on friendly electoral and judicial institutions to help it frustrate opposition plans with delaying or blocking tactics. Maduro challenged his opponents, saying no one can remove him. Meanwhile, as politics continues to heat up, away from the power circles and the parliament, people are still awaiting solutions to their problems that they don't know how to get through day to day.
sensational accusation, a UN human rights report has blamed South Sudan government of willful crimes against civilians. The report says that the government operated a scotched earth policy of deliberate rape and killing of civilians during the civil war in 2015. It said the prevalence of rape suggests its use in the conflict has become an acceptable practice by government soldiers and affiliated armed militias. It claimed that the groups allied to the government were allowed to rape women in lieu of wages. Now let's have a look at some more stories that are catching attention across the world. There's a chance that we might fall apart before too long. They call themselves Aiva. Arabic for yes, which is their message. A trier of Israeli musician sisters, the Aiva band marries Yemeni music with contemporary funk, electronica and hip-hop influences. Here's why Aiva has taken the Arab world by storm. Blend of cultures, bridge between generations, fusion of modern and traditional. And here we have girl power. Band Aiva. Tair, Liron, Tagel and Haim have used their Yemeni heritage to give a twist to hip-hop and Arabic music. The three sisters from Israel have combined the refrains from Yemenite oral folk songs to modern tunes. The three girls spent their childhood running around in a small desert village in Arava Valley and found their musical inspiration from their grandparents, Yemeni Arabic music, usually sung by women, handed down from generation to generation. We have this girl power and sisterhood, uh, but we also sing uh, uh, Yemenite women's songs, uh, which are secular, very simple, and songs that were created back then in Yemen, and um, they were passed down uh, for generations as an oral tradition. Israel's cultural scene has undergone a recent trend of third generation Jewish immigrants from Yemen or Morocco returning to their roots. And the past meets present music band featuring the three sisters has a huge fan base at home and abroad. The sisters also have a lot of followers in the Arab world. So we talk and write back to people who uh, leave us comments. Uh, from ever, Arab world and uh, it's amazing. Iowa's performance are uh, positive and catchy. Their first single, Habib Galabi, was a hit online and the band said they just wanted to bring a fresh desert breeze with their music. After almost 500,000 hits, the song was the in thing at Israeli marriages at clubs and on car radios. The dance moves, which were a fusion of folk steps and breakdowns, are also quite popular. A world of freedom and love, celebration of cultures and a place where everyone is happy in their own skins. That is what AWA aims to create with their unique tunes. That's why they say music makes the world go round. The apartheid government in South Africa named it protest theatre, yet its staff and actors called it theatre for the people. It became a one of the first places where blacks and whites worked together 
when South Africa was a segregated society. Today, 40 years since it came into existence, the theatre's appeal has spread far beyond the country's borders. They say that I am key to success, but what is success in this class ceiling that could find me? It became a place where barriers were broken, divides were removed, especially at a time of deep racial segregation South Africa was witnessing. The Johannesburg Market Theatre saw blacks and whites work together, staging the untold stories of South African life. Established days after the Soweto uprising in 1976, the theatre has turned 40 now and carries a legacy of equality. Started by Manny Manim and Barney Simon, it was named after the site it stands on. The place was originally a produce market which had relocated to another part of the city. With no money in hand, Manim and Simon approached others seeking help. At last, they were able to realise their vision and the market theatre came into existence only to enable the suppressed to express themselves. Theatre was, um, was, was, was really um, a catalyst to a lot of um, 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 dialogues that happened between people who were artificially separated by, by the system of the time and this became a ticket to escapism. Despite its humble beginning and the apartheid government's censorship, theatre's popularity kept growing. The theatre also has become a place to nurture young ideas. I'd say the Market Theatre has really catered for us um, as a platform for us to explore our stories in order to, um, in order to showcase to the South African market. Today, the Market Theatre's productions have a reach beyond South African stages as far as Europe, the Americas and Southeast Asia. Yet, it remains firmly rooted in downtown Johannesburg, which helped it grow both physically and artistically. The theatre that came with the idea of uniting people continues to bring people together. All I think is misunderstood and <laughs> just who are That's turning old with new ideas. Former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright used to say, it took me quite a long time to develop a voice and now that I have it, I am not going to be silent. Jordanian martial arts trainer Lina Khalife is a living example of that conviction. Her fierce passion for social change combined with her incredible martial arts skill set is inspiring change in the lives of women. She is helping thousands of women acquire the necessary skills to protect themselves in dangerous situations and develop self-confidence. It was when a friend confided that she was hit by her own father and brother, Taekwondo Black Belt, Lina Khalifa pledged to empower women in the best possible way she can. She didn't take long to come up with a place to teach self-defense to women in 2010, making it Jordan's first women-only martial arts center. At the facility in North Amman, her young students throw fast punches, closely following instructions from their short-haired 31-year-old coach. Her own country does not have effective laws that provide protection from harassment. A rapist in Jordan can avoid prison if he marries the victim. While murder is punishable by death penalty, in so-called honor killings, the murder of a female relative believed to have dishonored the family, courts usually commute or reduce sentences. A winner of a gold medal at the 2003 Junior Asian Championships, Lena wants women to be confident enough to fight harassment and defend themselves. My aim is to empower women and to make them confident and able to defend themselves. Sexual harassment happens worldwide. It is not as bad in Jordan as in Egypt, for example, but it does exist. Since starting She Fighter, the training centre, Khalifa says that she has trained thousands of women and girls aged between 4 and 75, including thousands of Syrian refugees and foreign domestic workers through the NGOs. Some of her students have been the victims of harassment and violence. In two to three months courses for four levels, Khalifa teaches a mixture of taekwondo and boxing, as well as self-defense tricks like how to escape a strangling hold or hair grab. She was even invited to the White House with US President Barack Obama 
saying, we want to empower leaders of social change like Lina Khalifa of Jordan. Undeterred by initial opposition from some in her country, Lina continues to lead that change and indeed has brought it in lives of many. This reminds me of what former UN Secretary General and Nobel Peace Prize winner Kofi Annan once said. There is no tool for development more effective than the empowerment of women. That brings us to the close of this edition of World Connect. Please do share your feedback with us on the show. You can write to us on our email ID, which is worldconnect with a K dot DT news at the rate gmail.com. You can also write to us on Facebook. But before we go, we leave you with glimpses of a conch shell contest in Florida. Let the sounds of conches reverberate around you. Thanks for watching.